Rosicrucian and Christianity Lectures by Max Heindel Narrated by Matthew Schmitz Lecture 4 Sleep, Dreams, Trance, Hypnotism, Mediumship, and Insanity We have seen that man is a very complex organism, consisting of 1. The dense body, which is his tool in action. 2. The vital body, a medium of vitality which makes action possible. 3. The desire body, whence comes desire and compels action. 4. The mind, a break on impulse giving purpose to action. 5. The ego, which acts and gathers experience from action. The purpose of life is to transform the powers latent in the ego into dynamic energy, whereby it may perfectly control its different vehicles and act as it pleases. We know that it does not have full sway now, or there would be no warfare in our breasts, as we say, between the spirit and the flesh, but in reality, as we should say, between the spirit and the desire body, it is this warfare that develops the spiritual muscle, as wrestling builds the physical muscle. It is easy to bid others to do this and that, but to enforce obedience from oneself is the hardest task in the world, and it has been truly said that the man who conquers himself is greater than he who takes a city. Goethe, the great initiate poet, gives us the reason why in the lines, From every power that holds the world in chains, Man frees himself when self-control he gains. Such a man is above all laws, whether made by man or God, not that he would break them, far from it, but for just the opposite reason, that his perfect obedience to them renders all laws superfluous in respect to him, as the law, Thou shalt not steal, is to one who has learned to respect the property rights of others. Sin or action contrary to the will of God, or the laws of nature, was before all law, and St. Paul well appreciates its beneficent action when he says that the law is a taskmaster to bring us to Christ, for without law we had not known sin. Whenever we break one of nature's laws, that transgression as a cause brings as effect a corresponding retribution. If we overeat or eat improperly, indigestion may result, or perhaps if the disturbance we have caused is serious, it may be necessary for nature to burn it out on the physical plane of action by means of a fever. If we sin against the laws of morality, social ostracism follows, and thus wrong on the moral plane brings retribution. But the man who uses his mental powers unworthily is the worst as well as the most dangerous, for the gourmand may be an otherwise exceedingly respectable and lovable person, practically injuring no one but himself. The immoral person, the common brawl and the gossip, are cancers on society, dangerous to all. They can, however, be shunned and avoided, and thus the dangers incident to contact with them may at least be minimized. They may and sometimes do repent and reform, but the most insidious of all wrong is that done upon the mental plane of action, where a man under the guise of perfect respectability, often under the cloak of benevolence, can blight the lives of others bend their wills to his own ends, yet seemingly remain irreproachable himself, and even be looked upon as a friend and benefactor by his victims. Thus, without danger of detection, he gains his end, whether that be gold or aggrandizement. His transgression is seldom punished in the same life in which committed, but often, in later lives, finds its expiation in congenital idiocy, without the chance of repentance or forgiveness, such as, for instance, a realization of wrong to another may bring in ordinary cases when repentance is accompanied by reform. The crime of the determined hypnotist is, in fact, a phase of what the Bible describes as sin against the Holy Spirit, spiritual evil, the greatest danger to society. The Holy Spirit is the creative principle in nature, and the creative force in man is its direct expression. The same force expresses itself through the generative organs to create a new body and through the brain to create new thoughts, which are afterwards crystallized to things. When anyone is victimized by a hypnotist, he ceases to be his own master and loses his faculty for independent thought under the spell of the hypnotist's suggestions, 
which are in fact commands, because the victim has no choice, but must obey. Therefore, as the hypnotist interferes with the expression of the creative faculty of thought in his victim, which faculty is a direct expression of the Holy Spirit, he is committing a sin against the Holy Spirit. To give point and force to the descriptions of such abnormal conditions as exist in dreams, trance, hypnotism, mediumship, obsession, and insanity, we will begin with an explanation of the condition of man in the normal state of waking and sleep as viewed from the standpoint of occult science. The Waking State In the waking state, all the vehicles of man are confined within the same space, as the bones, the flesh, and the various juices of the body are confined within the skin, so all the bodies of man are gathered within an egg-shaped cloud that reaches above the head, below the feet, and all around the visible body. No matter what position the dense body may take, it is always in the center of this aura, as the yolk is in the center of an egg. The aura surrounds man's dense body as the white of the egg surrounds the yolk. But that is not all, for this aura composed of man's finer vehicles not only surrounds the dense body, but permeates its every particle as well, in a manner similar to the way in which the blood pervades the whole dense body. Thus we see that these bodies are nearer than hands and feet, and though as invisible as our breath, they are not less real or less necessary. During life man cannot ordinarily separate them, and unless they are all together he cannot move and act as he does in ordinary daily life. During the waking state there is a constant war between the vital body and the desire body. The desires and impulses from the desire body are constantly impinging upon the dense body, impelling it to action, regardless of any damage resulting to the latter instrument, so that desire is gratified. It is the desire vehicle that urges the drunkard to fill his system with liquor, so that the chemical combustion of spirit may raise the vibrations of the dense body to such a pitch as to make it the willing tool of every mad impulse, wasting its stored energy with reckless prodigality. The vital body, on the other hand, has no other interest than the preservation of the dense vehicle. By way of the spleen, it specializes the colorless solar energy which pervades space, and by some strange chemical process transforms it into a vital fluid of beautiful pale rose color, sending it along every nerve and fiber of the body. The vital body ever aims to husband the energy it has stored in the dense body. It is constantly concerned in rebuilding the tissues when they are broken down and destroyed by the powerful onslaughts of the rampant desire body. This vital fluid has a function similar to that of electricity in a telegraph system, for even when such a system is built with wires connecting different stations and operators at their keys, the system will be dead until electricity speeds along the lines and carries the messages. So is the dense body useless unless the nerves are transversed by this vital fluid. When that fails, in whole or in part, we say that the body is paralyzed to that extent. We note the effect, but do not see the cause in the material world. We have in our body two nervous systems, the voluntary and the involuntary. The first named is operated directly by the desire body and controls the movements of the body, tends to break down and destroy, only partially restrained in its ruthless task by the mind. The involuntary system has its particular vantage ground in the vital body. It governs the digestive and respiratory organs, which build and restore the dense body. It is this war between the vital body and the desire body which produces consciousness in the physical world, and did not the mind act as a break on the desire body, our waking hours would be very short, and so would our lives, for the vital body would soon be overridden in its beneficent offices by the reckless desire body, as evidenced in the exhaustion which follows a fit of temper, for temper is a condition where the man has lost control, and the desire body rules unchecked. Sleep and Natural Trance In spite of all its efforts, however, the vital body slowly loses ground as the day goes along. The poisons of decaying tissue accumulate and impede the flow of the vital fluid. Its motion becomes more and more sluggish. In consequence, the visible body shows signs of exhaustion. At last, the vital body, so to say, collapses. The vital fluid ceases to flow along the nerves in sufficient quantity to maintain the poise of the dense body, and that renders it unconscious and therefore unfit for the use of the spirit. That is sleep. 
It is the idea of many people that sleep is a passive or negative state. Nothing could be more erroneous if that were the case. The body would awake as tired as when it went to sleep, or rather, it would never wake, for it was its inability to receive the vital fluid, caused by being clogged with poisons of decay, which sent it to sleep. And, if the only effect of that state were a negative cessation of waste and energy, the conditions would remain in status quo, and the body would sleep on. Sometimes, such a condition exists, lasting perhaps weeks or even months. The sleeper is then said to be in a trance. To keep up that state for any length of time and not have it result in death, functions of the vital body must not be entirely suspended. It must take care of a limited amount of digestion. What, then, is it that makes sleep a restorative state? In the very term restorative, there is implied an activity. If a building is to be restored, it is necessary that the tenants move out and that destruction, wear, and tear cease. But that is not enough. Workmen must be brought in to repair the damage incident to the use of the building. Only when that work has been done is restoration complete and the building ready for reoccupancy by the tenants. So also with the temple of the ego, our dense body, when that has been exhausted. It is then necessary that the ego, mind, and desire body vacate and give the vital body full sway, that it may restore the tone of the dense body, and thus when the dense body goes to sleep, there is a separation. The ego and the mind, clothed in the desire body, draw out from the vital body and the dense body, the two latter remaining on the bed, while the higher vehicles hover above or near the sleeping body. The process of restoration now begins. In a fight in the physical world, the injuries are never all on one side. The winner always has some lesions. The fiercer the fight, and the more evenly the combatants are matched, the more lesions go to each. So with the combating vital and desire bodies. The desire body wins every time, yet its victory is always a defeat, for it is then forced to leave the battlefield and the prize, the dense body, in the hands of the vanquished vital body and withdraw to repair its own shattered harmony. When it withdraws from the sleeping body, it enters that sea of force and harmony called the desire world. Here it lives over the scenes of the day, but in reverse order, from effects to causes, straightening out the tangles of the day, forming true pictures to replace the wrong impressions due to the limitations of the life in the dense body, and as the harmonies of the desire world pervade it, and wisdom and truth replace error, it regains its rhythm and its tone the time required to restore it varying according to how elusive, impulsive, and strenuous had been the life of the day. Then, and then only, does the work of restoring the vehicles left on the bed commence, and the restored desire body starts to revive the vital body, pumping rhythmic energy into it, and that in turn starts to work upon the dense body, eliminating the projects of decay, principally by means of the sympathetic nervous system, with the result that the dense body is restored and overflowing with life when the desire body, mind, and ego enter in the morning and cause it to wake. Dreams It sometimes happens, however, that we have become so absorbed and interested in the affairs of our mundane existence that even after the vital body has collapsed and rendered the dense body unconscious, we cannot make up our minds to leave it and commence the works of restoration. The desire body clinging like grim death, is perhaps only dragged half out by the ego and starts to ruminate over the happenings of the day in that position. It is evident that this is an abnormal condition. The proper connection between the different vehicles is ruptured in the first place by the collapse of the vital body and further disarranged by the unusual relative positions of the higher vehicles, which has partially disconnected the sense centers of the former from the latter, and the inevitable result is those confused dreams where the sounds and sights of the desire world are mixed with the happenings of daily life in the most grotesque and impossible way. At times, when something in daily life has particularly agitated the desire body, it happens that when it has severed connection with the lower vehicles and is engaged in the work of restoration by the above-mentioned review, that when a trying incident of the day appears and the desire body sees the solution, it will rush back into the dense body in order to impress the ideas on the brain, thereby causing the dense body to wake with the start. It is only in the fewest cases that it is able to bring back the solution that was so clear in the desire world. 
Even if it does succeed at impressing the solution on the brain, it is usually forgotten in the morning. The knowledge of this fact has caused many people to keep paper, pencil, and a light by the bedside, and often they are rewarded by finding solutions to their problems written in the morning without having even a recollection of writing. It is a good idea to follow. Under such a condition, where there is no complete separation of the vehicles, it is evident that waste is still going on and that restoration is impeded, the dense body tossing on the bed in extreme cases, and in consequence there is a tired feeling left in the morning due to the imperfect separation of the vehicles, which causes dreams and makes the sleep restless. Not all dreams are confused, however. Those, for instance, which bring logical solutions to problems of life or prophetically warn of impending trouble, often enable us to avoid or avert disaster. Such dreams generally occur just before waking, and only when there has been a complete separation of the vehicles previous to the awakening, for only then is it possible for a dream to be logical, and in that case it is merely that the knowledge of impending disaster seen by the ego in the desire world is successfully transmitted to the brain. It is a great help in furthering such impressions in the coming night if we hold the thought to the last, I'm going to sleep. I want to know about so-and-so, and I am going to remember it in the morning. If this is the last thought on going to sleep, it will bring the memory of the solution arrived at. To take up the time giving instances to prove the value of dreams would be a waste of time in a lecture. The daily press teems with instances of providential escapes attributable to warning dreams. The records of the Society for Psychical Research give voluminous evidence, and anyone in search of evidence will have no trouble in finding it. Hypnotism it is characteristic of the invisible bodies of man that they are acted upon by will. Every impulse to action that comes from within originates in the will of the man himself, while incentives to action arising from outside sources, commonly called circumstances, originate in the will of others, and the difference between the man of strong character, good or bad, and the weak man is that the former is impelled by his own will, acting from within which enables him, regardless of circumstances, to make his way as he determines. On the other hand, the weakling, who has not will, is the helpless sport of the billows of circumstance, dominated by the will of others, driftwood on the shoreless sea of life. To control others by the exercise of willpower is mental assault, and is even more reprehensible than assault on the physical plane of action. It is this mental assault which is called hypnotism and it is graded in its effect just as physical assault is. A strong man may administer a playful slap to get another to do his bidding, or he may beat him to unconsciousness. The hypnotist salesman administers just enough force to make the customer buy something he does not want or cannot afford, and then deludes himself by calling it legitimate business. Bad and widespread as this is, it is at least not attended by any of the after-effects incident to the practice of putting subjects into hypnotic sleep. The enormity of this crime can only be appreciated when the effect upon the invisible bodies of the subject is noted. No strong-willed person can be dominated by a hypnotist to the extent of being put to sleep, and not one who keeps a positive mental attitude can be dominated. Hence, the unsuspecting victim is first told to be perfectly negative and willing to be put to sleep, the passes of the hypnotist are not directed to the head and impinge upon the head of the vital body, squeezing it through the physical head so that it lies around the neck in thick rolls, something like the collar of a sweater. Thus the connection between the ego and the dense body is severed, as in sleep, and the higher vehicles withdrawn. But there is now a different condition than in the sleep state. The head of the vital body is not in its proper place, enveloping and permeating the dense physical head of the victim. That is not pervaded by ether from the vital body of the hypnotist, and thus he obtains power over his victims. If we know what wiretapping means, we have the key to the relation between the hypnotist and his victim, at least in a measure. If a man has a private telephone connection from his home to his office, and someone makes a connection in between, he will be able to intercept messages, impersonate the businessman, issue orders, etc. The hypnotist does something like that. He taps the line of communication between the ego and the body of his victim by interposing part of himself in that line, 
and by virtue of that hold he may force the ego to go out in the invisible world and get whatever information he desires, as far as it is possible, or he may make the dense body do foolish or criminal acts according to his pleasure. But even this is not the worst about hypnotism. By far the gravest danger to the victim arises from the fact that, once a part of the hypnotist's vital body has been introduced into his own, it cannot be entirely withdrawn at the awakening. A small part remains and forms a nucleus by which the hypnotist may gain ingress and subdue his victim more easily the next time, and each succeeding time something is added to this nucleus, so that by degrees the poor victim becomes perfectly helpless, amenable to the will of his master, independent of the distance, until the death of one or the other breaks the connection. This remnant of the hypnotist's vital body is also the storehouse for commands to be carried out at a future time, involving the performance of a certain act, on a certain day, at a certain hour. When the time arrives, the impulse is released like the spring of an alarm clock, and the victim must carry out the command, even to murder, yet has no idea that he is influenced by someone else. Therefore, hypnotism is the greatest crime on earth and the greatest danger to society. It is sometimes contended that hypnotism may be used benevolently for the cure of drunkenness and other vices, and it is readily admitted that, viewed solely from the material standpoint, that appears to be true, but from the viewpoint of occult science, it is far otherwise. Like all other desires, the craving for liquor is in the desire body, and it is the duty of the ego to master it by willpower. That is why he is in the school of experience called life, and no man can do his moral growing for him any more than he can digest another's dinner for him. Nature is not to be cheated. Each must solve his own problems, overcome his own faults by his own will. If, therefore, a hypnotist overpowers the desire body of a drunkard, the ego in the drunkard will have to learn its lesson in a future life if he dies before the hypnotist. But if the hypnotist dies first, the man will inevitably turn to drink again, for then the part of the hypnotist's vital body which held the evil desire in check gravitates back to its source, and the cure is nil. The only way permanently to master a vice is by one's own will. At the death of a hypnotist, all his victims are released, and no suggestion for a subsequent date will compel them. Mediumship To understand mediumship, it is necessary to know that, at death, the same separation takes place as in sleep, but it is permanent. The so-called dead have ego, mind, and desire body, and are often conscious of the world they have left for some time after. Some cling to the earth life, and cannot set their minds to learn the new lessons. We call them earthbound spirits. They cannot function in the visible world without a body, however, and so they take advantage of the fact that all spirits are not confined with equal rigor to the prison of the dense body. Those who are most closely bound are the rank materialists, those whose cords do not bind them so tightly are impressionists, capable of answering in some measure to spiritual vibrations. Persons of positive character, thus constituted, if they develop, do so by their own will and become trained occultists. Those of weak will can only develop by the aid of others and in a negative way. They are the prey of earthbound spirits who constitute themselves spirit guides and develop their victims as trance mediums, or, if the connection between the victim's dense and vital bodies be particularly lax, into materializing mediums. These earthbound spirit controls are in every respect like the hypnotist, except that they are invisible to their victims and have more power over them, because looked up to as higher beings, angels devoid of evil, and unselfishly aiming to diffuse happiness or wisdom. As a matter of fact, there is no transforming power in death. The sinner does not become a saint, nor the ignoramus a Solomon because of it, and it is a pathetic sight to the trained clairvoyant who sees the imposition practiced by unprincipled spirit controls upon their unsuspecting victims, who are so thoroughly unsophisticated that they fail to distinguish the true character of the impostors and accept their inane, goody-goody phrases as sublime wisdom. They have done some good in proving the reality of a life after death, but much harm to mediums. The modus operandi of the invisible manipulator is simply to push the higher vehicles out of the lower bodies of the unresisting medium, step in himself, and take control. 
When he leaves, he also takes part of the medium's vital body to use as a key or lever next time. In some cases, he is not satisfied to borrow a body, but steals one and keeps the owner out permanently. We see the same body, but there is another soul within, which shows different habits and tastes altogether. That is called obsession, and can be detected by the fact that the iris neither responds to light nor distance by contraction or expansion, for the eye is the window of the soul, and only the owner can truly manipulate it. Hence, the eyes of mediums under control are always closed or have a glassy stare. There are certain means of getting rid of an obsessing spirit and restoring the body to the owner, but that cannot be given publicly. We have seen that in the waking state, the dense body and the vital body are surrounded and interpenetrated by an egg-shaped cloud comprising the desire body in the mind. These vehicles are all concentric and form so many links in a chain. It is the interpolation of one into the other so that the sense centers in one are in proper alignment with the sense centers of the other, which enables the ego to manipulate the complex organism and perform in an ordered manner the life processes which we call reason, speech, and action. If there is a maladjustment anywhere, the ego will be correspondingly hampered in its expression. This perfect balance is health. The opposite is disease. Disease takes many forms. One is insanity, and that also is of different kinds. Where the connection between the sense centers of the dense body and the vital body is askew, where sometimes the head of the vital body towers above the dense head instead of being concentric with it, the vital body is out of adjustment with both the higher vehicles and the dense body. Then we have the docile idiot, where the dense and vital bodies are in adjustment but the break is between the vital body and the desire body, a similar condition obtains, but when the break is between the desire body and the mind, we have the raving maniac, who is more ungovernable than a wild animal, for that is checked by the group spirit. In that case, all the animal propensities are followed blindly. When the break is between the ego and the mind, the latter takes charge of the three vehicles, and we have the consummate cunning which characterizes a certain class of insane. Such a one will successfully hide his baneful designs and outwit all to attain revenge for fancied wrong or other low desire until the victim is within his power. Then the brute nature of the desire body will spend itself in some horrible outrage, or the mind may even then dominate the desire body and exert its diabolical cunning in slow torture before the desire body breaks away and ends the sufferings of the victim, perhaps brutally, but far more mercifully than continued torture. The object lesson to be learned from a knowledge of these matters is that we must remain our own masters and never under any pretext allow ourselves to be hypnotized or controlled by an outside agency. Also, that self-mastery is our goal, and not mastery over others.